Coming in at number 5 we have the Vatican Secret Archives. The Vatican Secret Archives is considered to be the world's most secure building, but why is it so locked down? What secrets are being hidden behind the walls? The amount of history located there is immense. The Vatican Secret Archives is home to the largest collection of Catholic books, documents and doctrine in the world. It boasts letters from well known figures such as Abraham Lincoln and Mary Queen of Scots. It contains 53 miles of shelving with 35,000 volumes in the selective catalogue alone. The archives also include state papers, correspondence, account books and many other documents the church has acquired over the centuries. Naturally many people have speculated that there must be secret documents amongst the 50 plus miles of shelving in the Vatican's archives. Of course no one is allowed to browse the archives which makes it even more mysterious. Only select scholars, academics and journalists are allowed to enter and this is a rule that will never likely change. Many believe that the Pope and many people around him keep very classified and secret information in the archives that they don't want the world knowing. One theory is that the archives contains correspondence between Saint Paul and Emperor Nero pertaining to Jesus' existence and his biological descendants. And some believe that the Vatican may be hiding proof that Jesus did in fact exist or didn't exist at all. Next is the confirmation and evidence of alien life forms such as extraterrestrial skulls. Some claim that in 1998 skulls with elongated heads and small faces resembling aliens were found underneath the Vatican. Ever since, the Vatican has kept all evidence of aliens a secret to not discredit Christianity. Another secret being held from the world is the Grand Grimoire, which is an alleged medieval book that is believed to possess immense powers. It was written in the 16th century by Honorius of Thebes who claimed to be possessed by the devil himself. In the book it has instructions on how to make magic talismans and amulets, how to make magic spells and even how to summon demons and even offers instructions on how to summon the devil himself and make a deal with him. If the Vatican is keeping world shattering secrets in its archives we may never know due to its high level of security and it only being accessible to a slight few. So our questions of what is really in there may never be answered. In at number 4 we have the Church of Rome, destruction of important Jewish historical documentation. In 1415 the Church of Rome took an extraordinary step to destroy all knowledge of the two second century Jewish books that is said contained the true name of Jesus Christ. The Antipope Benedict XIII firstly signalled out for condemnation a secret Latin treatise called Ma Yesu and then issued instructions to destroy all of the copies of the Book of Alaxi. No editions of these writings now publicly exist but church archives recorded that they were once in popular circulation and known to early presbyters. Knowledge of these writings survived from quotations made by Bishop Hippolytus of Rome and Saint Epiphanius of Salamis along with references in some early traditions of the Talmud of Palestine and Babylonia. The Rabbanic fraternity once held the destroyed manuscripts with great reference for they were comprehensive original records reporting of the life of Rabbi Jesus. Later in a similar manner Pope Alexander VI ordered all copies of Talmud destroyed. The Council of the Inquisition required as many Jewish writings as possible to burn with the Spanish Grand Inquisitor. Thomas de Torquemada responsible for the elimination of 6,000 volumes at Salamanca. In 1550 Cardinal Carath the Inquisitor General repealed all previous permission for priests to read the Talmud which he said contained hostile stories about Jesus Christ, leading him to seize every copy he could find in Rome and burn them. Solomon Romano also burnt many thousands of Hebrew scrolls and in 1559 every Hebrew book in the city of Prague was confiscated. The mass destruction of Jewish books included hundreds of copies of the Old Testament and caused irreversible loss of many original handwritten documents. The mass destruction of Jewish writings, the church overlooked two particular British documents that still exist to this day in the British Museum. Coming in at number 3 we have the Orphans of Duplessis. In the 1930s and 1940s in Quebec City was marred by unprecedented acts of corruption and repression due to a conservative revolution better known as the Great Darkness, which was led by Premier Maurice Duplessis and many of the acts were involving the Catholic Church. In 1940 the Duplessis government and along with the Catholic Church began to diagnose orphan children with mental problems, even though these children were perfectly healthy. Due to this thousands of orphan children were sent to a psychiatric institution of the church so that the church could receive a government subsidy for the treatment of these children. Unfortunately this was a reality for so many because mental health wasn't as widely known as today and it was unknown how to treat those suffering back then. At this time many orphanages were converted into asylums for children and more than 20,000 were misdiagnosed and imprisoned in asylums so that the Catholic Church could earn more money. According to reports many of these children weren't orphans at all but children coming from single mothers who were forcibly taken into church custody and they didn't admit children out of wedlock. The people forced to be involved in this were subjected to nightmares including drug testing and other medical experiments like electric shock therapy. In the 
1990s, almost 3,000 survivors of the Duplessis orphan scandal revealed the horrific events they had to go through, but the government made a sad excuse of a settlement with the victims and the Catholic Church who remained silent to stifle the scandal. In at number 2 we have Joan of Arc. Most people know the story of Joan of Arc. She is mostly considered a hero of France for her role during the war. She is now considered a saint but the Catholic Church hated her. She claimed that she was receiving messages from God, instructions on what she should do to help her people. This angered many higher ranking officials within the church. Joan saw her first vision around the age of 13 in 1425. The figure she identified as Saint Michael surrounded by angels appeared in her garden. After receiving the vision she wept as she wanted to go with him. Throughout her life she continued to be visited and given messages from the Lord. By 1428 Joan's visions told her she must leave her home and go to France. Since then she gained followers and support in her fight to recover France from English domination. The Catholic Church denounced her visions and set out to take her down. In 1430 Joan was captured. She was put on trial for heresy even though Joan was a devout Christian. They gave Joan as many charges as they could hoping she would be found guilty of at least one of them. The military were relieved of her capture. They believed her to have supernatural powers. They feared her as it was not typical for women to wield such power and command. One of the most well known charges against Joan was that she wore men's clothing, something apparently illegal back then. In reality this came from the fact that she wore armour while in enemy territory, something not seen as being ladylike for the time. The trial was not conventional for the time. It was clear no matter what she did they were determined to find her guilty. Although she was impressive during the trial she was ultimately found guilty. She was found guilty of heresy and sentenced to death. She was to be burned at the stake. Joan is seen as a hero and a saint today. The Catholic Church tries to distance themselves from her mistreatment. And finally in at number 1 we have the Vatican's quest for aliens. It might surprise you to know that the Catholic Church has a keen interest in aliens. They hold a conference each year to talk about astrobiology. If you haven't heard that term before it's a term they created to make their meetings about aliens seem more legitimate. The Vatican has often defended itself in the public about their interest in extraterrestrial. As they often state evolution is not something they believe in, you would assume they also didn't believe in aliens. The Vatican even has its own team of scientists looking into the existence of these beings and attempting to make contact. The chief astronomer stated, there is no conflict between believing in God and in the possibility of extraterrestrial brothers, perhaps more evolved than humans. He went on to explain that you cannot put limits on God's creative freedom, so it makes sense after creating Earth he would go to create other beings. Some even believe that humans are lost sheep of the universe and we need to find the more evolved of God's creations. All of this would not be such a surprise if they hadn't condemned science since the creation of the church. In the 17th century they condemned the astronomer Galileo for insisting that the earth revolved around the sun. It seems they had progressed in some of their beliefs since then. Some believe that they spent a lot of money on their exploration into space and have even discovered a few things that they are keeping to themselves. Some historians believe that within the Vatican secret archive there is evidence of contact with extraterrestrials. It is not known why they would keep this information from the world. Do they want to use it to further their beliefs or maybe they don't consider everyone to be worthy? We do know there are stories of communication with other beings but the information is mostly kept with the church. In 1917, three children saw the Virgin Mary who gave them a telepathic message. The message was that we are not alone on the planet. They warned that humanity needs to prepare for their return. The Catholic Church censored these messages. The only person who knew the full content of the message was the Pope, who refused to release the details of all three. This is just one instance of messages received on Earth that have been held by the Vatican for years. It is believed they have no intention to release this information. The archive is heavily guarded. Who knows what could be hidden within their findings? Number five on this list is Cadaver Sinyad. This is one of the weirdest events in history, guys. Daily Gister says, In 897, the Vatican saw one of the most bizarre episodes in history. The corpse of a pope was put on trial by his living successor. Pope Formosus, dead for a few months, was hardly qualified to defend himself in a court of law. Nonetheless, Pope Stephen VI had the body disinterred, dressed in robes, and propped up on the papal throne to stand trial. He even appointed a deacon to speak on the corpse's behalf. While Stephen VI hurled accusations at Formosus, the accused remained stoically silent, as might be expected, of a corpse. The dead pope was found guilty of usurping the papacy. Stephen VI declared all of his acts as pope null and void, all consecrations, all appointments, all ordinations were undone. So as you guys can imagine, the church doesn't really talk about this episode too much because it's kind of embarrassing honestly. Clearly the current pope during this time was not fit to be in charge at all and might have even been losing his mind a little bit. 
This is pretty dumb, but at least it makes for a good story to tell at a dinner party or something. So there, stuff that one in your back pocket and save it for later, guys. Number four on this list is Sixtus the Sixth. Sixtus the Sixth was a pope who was in power back in the late 1400s. He definitely made some questionable life choices though, some of which I'm sure the church would love to forget. Business Insider writes, Sixtus the Sixth, elected in 1471, apparently had six illegitimate children, including one with his sister. That didn't stop him from policing the sexual appetites of the underlings though. He created a church tax on and charged priests for having mistresses. Sixtus the Sixth also had a taste for nepotism, as did many other popes. He made six of his nephews cardinals. My dude literally had a kid with his sister. I'm an only child, so I don't really know what it's like to have a sibling, but even I'm grossed out about hearing that. Obviously, it's a pretty bad look for the church when their literal leader is shacking up with his sis. Something that I don't think God or the Bible is gonna look too kindly upon. Number three on this list is God's Banker. God's Banker was the nickname that they gave to a man named Roberto Calvi. Forbes writes, it was described as a scene straight out of an Alfred Hitchcock film. The man's corpse dangled from an orange nylon rope tied to scaffolding under London's Blackfriars Bridge. He was dressed in a gray suit with a white waistcoat and a blue striped shirt. He wore shoes and socks, but no tie or belt. An expensive watch on his wrist was stopped at 1.52 a.m. and nearly 12 pounds worth of pieces of bricks were stuffed into his trousers. A young postal clerk had made the grim discovery on his way to work on the morning of June 18, 1982 and alerted the police. Officers who examined the body found a wallet containing around 13,000 in various currencies, Italian, Austrian shillings, American dollars, Swiss francs, and a passport bearing the name Gian Roberto Calvini. This man was found dead, but why and how does the church play into this? Well, the local writes, the chairman of Milan's Banco Ambrosiano, in which the Vatican was the main shareholder, had been found guilty of illegally exporting billions of lire. He shaved off his mustache and fled to London where he was murdered. An American archbishop wanted for questioning was granted immunity by the Vatican, while five Italians were acquitted of the crime in 2007. Basically, this guy was in deep with some very bad people, and the Vatican were some of those people. Also pretty questionable just literally giving immunity to this archbishop because you can. It should also be noted that this banker was believed to be in deep with the mafia as well. The Vatican seems to have an interesting choice in friends. Number two on this list is World War II. I don't think it's unfair to say that World War II might have been the closest that we got to a fight where it truly was good versus evil. One side was fighting for freedom and the other side represented death and hatred. Thankfully for all of us, freedom won out in the end and the horrifying regime that was trying to take over collapsed. After World War II, some people had to pay for what they did. After all, it saw arguably the worst genocide in history and some horrible wartime atrocities. People were put on trial and individuals who hadn't been supporting the freedom side were heavily scrutinized. The Vatican during this time was noticeably pretty silent though. Who did they support during this period of time and why didn't they do anything? It's believed that Jewish people were actually rounded up outside of the Pope's window at one time or another, and the Pope would have been able to see firsthand what was actually going on behind closed doors. Why didn't he do anything to stop this? The actions, or lack thereof, of the Pope at the time, Pope Pius XII, have been under heavy fire for years. It's even been thrown around that this Pope collaborated with these deathly acts and was on board with them. Now there isn't any proof of this, but the Vatican isn't necessarily opening their doors and having people come in to check their records either. They would love to keep whatever went on back then completely under wraps and just forget that it ever happened. Sounds to me like something potentially sketchy might have been going on with the church that they don't want us to know about. And finally, number one on this list is Pope John Paul I. This is one of the biggest scandals to rock the church and the Vatican and something that they're more than happy to keep under wraps. The Week writes, In The Godfather Part 3, a shady deal between the Mafia and the Vatican leads to the murder of the Pope. Was this based on a true story? Possibly. 
On the morning of September 28, 1978, Pope John Paul I was found dead sitting up in his bed after only 33 days in office. Although Vatican officials claimed the 65 year old pope died of a heart attack, there was never an autopsy and at the time the Vatican definitely had ties to organized crime. Sure enough, in 1982, Vatican Bank President Father Paul Marinkis resigned from his post after a series of scandals exposed the bank's ties to the Mafia. Eventually, the bank had to repay more than $200 million to its creditors. But Marinkis was never indicted of a crime, and though he was suspected of being involved in several mysterious deaths, including Pope John Paul I, Marinkis successfully claimed diplomatic immunity in the United States and retired to Arizona in 1990 and died there 16 years later. Until I started really digging into potential church secrets, I never had any idea that they had ties to the Mafia. This is because they've tried to cover it up as much as possible. Now, you might be thinking in this example specifically that the fact that they neglected to do an autopsy is evidence of something. Like the church knew that they would find something that they didn't want to be revealed. But the truth is, they never do an autopsy on the Pope. It's believed that performing an autopsy on the Pope will taint the body in some way and that it will make it harder to get into heaven. The body must remain clean and untampered within its path to God. This is all fine and good, but it means that you get instances like this where this person potentially got murdered and no one will be able to prove it. It's also really hard to get anywhere with the higher ups of this organization because oftentimes they just claim diplomatic immunity. It's widely believed now that the Vatican was at one point deeply involved with the Mafia and might even still be. They have way more money than anyone thinks that they should have and this money didn't just appear out of thin air. It's possible that their ties with the Mafia in this case even caused a murder. Number 5 on this list is St. Mary's Catholic Church. This is a Catholic church in Nashville, Tennessee that is apparently deeply haunted. World on Fire says there are three ghosts rumored to haunt this church and its grounds. One story holds that a priest died during construction of the church. Another story claims that during the Civil War, a Catholic priest serving as a chaplain for the Confederate Army was shot and killed in the church. There's another rumor that the ghost is the spirit of Bishop Richard Pius Miles, the first bishop of Diocese of Nashville who died in 1860. He was buried in the church basement and supposedly still haunts his old stomping grounds. According to one story from 1937, a pounding at his bedroom door woke up a priest in the rectory, but he could find no one there. After he fell asleep, he was woken up again, this time by a pounding on the headboard of his bed. There was no one in his room, so the awakening was attributed to supernatural causes by superstitious locals. I can't say that I personally would substitute a ghost pounding on my headboard's wake up call for a regular alarm clock, but hey, whatever gets you out of bed in the morning, right? Nowadays, the three ghosts that wander around here are sort of just part of the church and accepted among those who pray and worship here. Apparently these ghosts are relatively calm and won't cause too much trouble other than the occasional midnight stomping that is. There was however one story where the chaplain for the confederate army ghost attacked someone. It happened over 50 years ago now, but apparently a woman and her young son were walking past the church and got bombarded by this ghost. They both managed to get out okay, but they were obviously really shaken up. Now nobody knows why this ghost did this or what the story was, but we think that this woman and her son were descendants of someone who had dealings with him in real life. Potentially their grandfather killed this man or something along those lines. It's all a bit hazy, but the good thing is that's the only group of people his ghost has ever chosen to attack before. Other than that, these ghosts are just relatively annoying, but they shouldn't cause you too much problems if you go here. Number four on this list is the widow. There was a widow who lived in the 20th century who was a very devout Catholic. For some reason, this woman, who we're going to call Ruth, had a very strong connection to the spirits that were in purgatory. Her story goes like this. The first soul Ruth encountered was her departed husband. He had often been impatient during his bout with cancer and had reproached God. 
One evening, Ruth heard a voice. That happened almost every evening over a long time when she came in from the stable. Then she suddenly recognizes the voice of her husband, but she isn't quite sure yet. Then she kneels down and just prays the rosary. She recommends her husband in particular. Yes, she thinks. He was often rather impatient. Is that perhaps the reason he must still do penance? A few evenings later, she sees a nebulous apparition right in the middle of the room. She takes holy water and prays, Oh Lord, give him eternal rest. It makes her very upset, and then she sees her husband. He speaks quietly, Don't be afraid, Ruth, it's me. I may come here to ask your help. Pray three chaplets each day. And then he was gone. So every day she prays three chaplets. Each time she adds, Good God, forgive my husband his impatience when he suffered. After some weeks, her husband stands again in the middle of the room. He looks well. He's friendly and beautiful. She recalls how he was a young man. He says nothing. He only looks at her so grateful and full of love. Then she asks him, How are you, Jacob? He answers clearly and quietly, I'm fine. I may come soon. I thank you, Ruth. I thank you so much. And after this, he never appeared again. So that's a pretty famous story, and Ruth went on to interact with many ghosts like this in purgatory through her life. In fact, some people started to speculate that she may even be a ghost herself as well. Number three on this list is the Most Holy Trinity Church. Here we have another Catholic church that's meant for worship, but has been riddled by a haunting. World on Fire says there are a few possible origins of the hauntings that supposedly plague this old parish. One claims that the current church building, built from 1882 to 1885, stands over an old cemetery where some bodies are still buried. Supposedly the ghosts of the folk under the church haunt the building and mysteriously turn lights on and off, open and close doors, and and walk back and forth. Or it could just be living people doing those things since those activities, believe it or not, are not limited to ghosts. The living can also open doors and turn on lights. At least they could last time I checked. Or maybe I'm a ghost and I don't even know it. Anyways, another source of the ghost legend is that one of the first pastors of the church, Monsignor Michael May, passed away in his bedroom and continues to haunt the church grounds. Apparently, visitors hear mysterious steps at all hours of the night, and dogs have been known to stare as if in a trance at the stairs and dining room of the rectory. In all honesty, dogs staring at things? Hmm, definitely not indisputable ghostly evidence. I mean, I've seen dogs do some weird stuff before, so I don't think that we can prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt based on their activities. However, it is very important to note nonetheless, whenever a big storm is coming, watch what your animals do. I bet that they'll go and hide or act differently right before a massive thunderstorm or a tornado or something. Us humans, we don't even notice it, we don't sense it at all, but they definitely will. This sort of weird sense, it also translates to ghosts as well, so maybe the dog really is seeing something from the afterlife at this church. Number two on this list is Annalise Michelle. This is a very sad story where there may not ever have been any ghosts involved, but they sure thought that there was. Wikipedia says, when Michelle was 16, she experienced a seizure and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with depression and was treated by a psychiatric hospital. By the time she was 20, she had become intolerant of various religious objects and began to hear voices. Her condition worsened despite medication, and she became suicidal, also displaying other symptoms for which she took medication as well. After the taking of psychiatric medications for five years failed to improve her symptoms, Michelle and her family became convinced that she was possessed by a demon. As a result, her family appealed to the Catholic Church for an exorcism. While rejected at first, True priests got permission from the local bishop in 1975. The priests began conducting exorcism sessions and the parents stopped consulting doctors. Annalise Michelle stopped eating food and died of malnourishment and dehydration after six 
67 exorcism sessions. Michelle's parents and the two Roman Catholic priests were found guilty of negligent homicide and were sentenced to six months in jail as well as a fine. This might not be the most terrifying of all of the ghost stories on here considering the only real ghost involved was the fear that everybody had to begin with. Poor Annalise would have went through absolute agony in her final days when there probably wasn't any paranormal activity to even begin with. And finally number one on this list is St. Rita's Church. Several decades ago there was one heck of a ghostly interaction that went down at this church. World on Fire says on All Souls Day in the early 1960s, St. Rita's Parish had a ghostly visitation. More than a dozen parishioners had gathered there to pray when sometime in the early evening the organ began to play by itself. Suddenly, six robed monks appeared, three wearing black and three wearing white. The parishioners attempted to flee, but they found the doors of the church were locked. The phantom monks moved towards the parishioners while the organ continued its dirge. Finally, the vision faded as a disembodied voice whispered, pray for us. So next time you see a ghost, it probably just wants to ask you a favor and hopefully not kill you. All they were asking for was a little prayer, which I think everyone would have been more than happy to indulge with at that time. Of course, having a bunch of ghost monks show up out of nowhere, lock all of the doors and keep you in there, that's pretty terrifying. Everyone is still very wary around St. Rita's Church in case these monks ever do come back. Number 5, the Zuzu. Our first terrifying demon up on this list has made quite the career for himself in pop culture. He's picked up some small gigs here and there, he's serving as a sort of mascot of sorts for the real fake band Gorillaz, multiple cameos on Futurama, and won some acclaim for his star studded role in The Exorcist, possessing Reagan and making us all afraid of pea soup. Although his real historical background is far more interesting than any of his pop culture appearances. Pazuzu has been around for a long time, first being recorded as a Babylonian demon wind god who was always playing both sides so he'd come out on top. He was a god of wind and it was thought that the wind ravaging storms and locusts were all byproducts of Pazuzu's rage. But he was also thought to be a protector. He would protect the home, taking a particular liking to watching over pregnant women. He was an incredibly destructive force in nature and when it would come time to throw down, Pazuzu would fly across the world breaking the wings of other demons to prevent them from getting into any trouble. Sort of like a demonic Batman. His portrayal in The Exorcist is probably where most people know him from and assume those things about him where he's seen as a much more plain Jane possessing demon lacking his impressive wings and other traits and not doing a whole lot of flying around or anything with the wind, focusing a lot more on projectile vomiting and harassing a couple of priests. The real Pazuzu is a lot cooler than his exorcist appearance, but no doubt more people know about that than they do an ancient Babylonian wind god. I don't think I'd like to spend much time with either incarnation face to face, and those priests definitely didn't want to either. Now ghouls, goblins, lend me your ears, and subscribe if you wouldn't mind. Number 4. Belthegor. Now another demon who's had his moment in pop culture, maybe you recognize Belthegor from Supernatural's first fledgling season, all the way back when the boys were wide eyed and hadn't even died once yet. Or maybe if you're a Persona fan, you recognize Belphegor as the perpetually bored demon on the can. So now it's a video game with a talking cat. And you play as a guy who's got a healthy sleep schedule and can manage his social circle well. It's not a game focused on realism. But it turns out, doing a little research, there was a reason for this foul demon's appearance. One of the seven princes of hell, the demonic icon of Slop's favorite offering isn't blood or a fresh goat, but a little mud pie, feces if you want to get scientific with it. Look, I'm not going to judge and I I'm not going to ask what he's doing with it. Old lore just says that if you wanted to summon Belphegor, you had to bring him a lot of feces. There's no metric volume ever listed, just a lot. If you do summon him, he'll trade you wondrous riches, expand your ability to discover new things, expand your consciousness, but at the cost of the temptation of your mortal soul and you'll also probably never be able to wash your hands clean again. I'm sorry, I don't usually work so blue, it's the lazy man's comedy, although perchance that's fitting for the demon prince of sloth. Belthegor has been depicted in all manner of ways over the years, appearing sometimes as esoteric things like tree branches or sometimes taking the form of beautiful women. But one wood carving in the 18th century of him sitting on an 18th century john sealed his fate pretty much forever and then since then he's almost always been depicted as a horned demon sitting on a throne of sorts. Belthegor, I want to make something clear here. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just, I'm trying to make sense of all this. Number three, the Legion. 
Now this next demon is a tiny bit of a cheat because although it's supposed to be a top 5 list, I'm about to make it a top 500,000 list. This next demon is known as the Legion for it is many. The Legion's first documented recording is from the Gospel of Mark where Jesus Christ encountered a man possessed by a demon. When he spoke to the man in an effort to exorcise him, he asked for the name of the demon inside him and the man responded, Legion, for there were many devils inside him. Upon being exorcised from the man, the Legion asked if it could instead be transferred to a herd of pigs, which he then obliged. Now the Legion is pretty atypical when it comes to demons. It's not the prince of anything, it's not the manifestation of any one sin, and it's not any one thing at all. The Legion is made of countless demons that all function together in unison like a hive mind. When one has a thought, the rest of the Legion obeys. When one member of the Legion speaks, the rest of them speak all at once. Now sometimes the armies of Satan are referred to as the Legions of Hell, but I guess the Legion is a separate thing altogether. It must make filling out forms very difficult. No one's really sure what sort of demons the Legion are or, or what they look like even. It's just agreed that there's a lot of them all working together on their common goals. Like I said, no one really knows what they look like, but if you've ever seen a horde of, you know, anything all in one place, you can't imagine that it would be anything pleasant. Now the Legion isn't as much of a pop culture starlet as some of the other demons I've mentioned on this list, but that doesn't mean that it's influenced things in pop culture. The phrase Legion for We Are Many appears in all sorts of different things, probably because it's just a very cool way to describe yourself. A recurring boss fight in the Castlevania video games called Legion appears as a writhing mass of bodies, no doubt inspired by the story. And the character in Mass Effect named Legion is an AI life form comprised of thousands of individual AI working in tandem who directly references the story, introducing itself, saying we are Legion for we are many. And while I'm on it, Legion was the entire best character in Mass Effect, but that's neither here nor there. Sleep easy, big guy. Number two, Beelzebub. Now we're getting into the big hitters. Beelzebub is thought to be one of the first angels to have ever fallen to hell, alongside Leviathan and Lucifer himself. He and Lucifer actually have a bit of an identity crisis, as the two are sometimes thought to be interchangeable. They must have similar haircuts. Some demonologists argue that Beelzebub is another name for Lucifer, and some others pose that he's one of his most trusted lieutenants. But whatever Beelzebub is, everyone can agree that he's pretty horrifying. His history is fairly interesting. It's thought that his namesake is a mockery of the god Baal, an ancient Bronze Age god of fertility. Some scholars believe that Beelzebub's name comes from Baalzebub, translating to Lord of the Flies, inferring that the followers of Baal are nothing more than flies worshipping a dung god. They didn't get the memo that Belphegor was the dung god. The Lord of the Flies sort of ended up becoming Beelzebub's title, with almost all depictions of the demon featuring flies in ubiquitous amounts around him. Occasionally he's even depicted as a giant fly, it's very Kafkaesque. Beelzebub is said to be one of the most powerful demons inside of Hell's domain, capable of great control over humanity, able to tempt them. Beelzebub was cited during the Salem Witch Trials as the entity that had corrupted and swayed so many women to witchery. Now there's some discrepancy as to what sin Beelzebub is thought to preside over, with some offerings saying that he represents pride, some others saying that he represents gluttony, which I would say probably seems a little more fitting for a fly demon anyway, and he's most commonly associated with gluttony. A number one, Asmodeus. Yeah, it probably would have made a lot of sense to have Lucifer as the number one spot on this list. I mean, he's the king of hell and all that. So let's just take this moment, give him an honorable mention, and say he's at the number zero spot. Just because I thought it was a little obvious, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you know who Satan is, and there's other demons we could talk about, you know, bring up some unknown ones. So filling in at the number one spot is Asmodeus, one of the princes of hell and the embodiment of the cardinal sin of lust. Asmodeus fell from heaven alongside the other fallen angels, reforming as a prince of hell. Asmodeus is said to have been married to Lilith, the primordial she-demon, famed for her banishing from the Garden of Eden and famed for destroying Fraser Crane. Lilith was cursed and banished for her defilement and depicted as a temptress. And Asmodeus saw all that and was like, hey girl, I'm into all that stuff. You want to procreate an endless stream of demons into the world and reign over a dominion of chaos? And the rest is wedded bliss. Depictions of Asmodeus vary pretty wildly from case to case. Occasionally he's drawn as a handsome young fella, 
but most commonly he is depicted as a squat, vaguely humanoid creature with a rooster leg, the tail of a snake, three heads comprising of a bull, a goat, and a scruffy demon head as the center. Asmodeus presides over lust with the help of his beloved Lilith, and the two tempt humans with madness and desire to ruin people with lechery. Somehow this wasn't enough for Asmodeus though, as some stories also describe Asmodeus as having command over the betting halls of hell, and is responsible for tempting man's souls towards gambling. So what I am hearing from this is that Asmodeus probably parties harder than any demon out there. Number 5. Mammon There's nothing wrong with wanting a little, right? It's nice to want. Nothing better than having a little money and power. For most of us who weren't born into a Fortune 500 lineage, it might be a little bit tricky, unless you got a little bit help. Maybe like from Mammon, the embodiment of human greed. You know, he's actually a lot more generous than his position as greed demon might suggest. You know, you don't have to do too much. If you just give over your eternal soul and pledge yourself to an eternity in his service, he might reward you with great riches. That's a pretty solid transaction. Mammoth is thought to originate from an ancient word for wealth, and it's thought that this is where Mammon was first born from. He was mankind's inherent desire for wealth and greed twisted out of subconscious want. The Gospel of Luke and Matthew both directly quote this saying, you cannot serve both God and mammon, meaning you can't have a pious life and also find yourself on a quest for massive wealth, and later taken literally to mean you can't serve one of the seven princes of hell if you worship God. Mammon is greedy. Makes sense? He's real real greedy. It's said that of all the archdukes and princes of hell, Mammon is more concerned with staring at the gold pavement than any of Lucifer's rebellion or business of the heavens, taken to mean that Mammon doesn't really concern himself with anything that doesn't involve cold, hard coin. He is on that grind set 24-7. The demon of greed has taken many forms over the years, with his most consistent depiction being that of a fairly normal looking humanoid looming over his subjects in a giant golden throne, looking down on those who would call for his aid. He's also associated with a wolf, and is believed to be able to take the form of one for his dealings on earth. It's said that part of the arcane ritual to evoke Mammon's spirit is to imagine your spirit as a golden wolf calling out to him. If you do invoke Mammon, just be sure you're being reasonable with what you ask for. You never know what happens if you get too greedy. Abessathibu It's said that when the rebellion began, Lucifer fell from heaven and was cast out alongside the other fallen angels. Well, who were the lesser known fallen angels? Abezathibu is an obscure demon, but a threatening one nonetheless, and a very difficult name to pronounce. In the Testament of Solomon, the demon Abezathibu introduces himself as a threat to God's will, and anyone who serves God. Abezathibu rules over some dominions of hell, serving as one of Lucifer's trusted lieutenants. He was originally an angel, but unhappy, and when cast out with the rest of them, fell to earth disfigured and vengeful. As he fell out of the kingdom of heaven, the other angels desperately grabbed at his wings to try and retrieve him. But instead of restraining him, the process ripped his wing from his back, leaving Abezathibu with a singular, dark, monstrous red wing. Although, I doubt he minds much, because to be honest, that sounds sick as all hell. It probably works really well for his demon aesthetic. Abethasibu presides over the pits of Tartarus, a unique dimension in hell originating from Greek mythology as a depth of the underworld. Abethasibu is a powerful sorcerer, boasting to King Solomon that he's far superior to the prophet Moses in every way. He brags of his sorcery and magic, being able to shift ideas and human perception in his favor, conjuring miracles, wonders, and form signs to humans, and is even able to bestow his gift to humans in exchange for favor. Abezathibu takes a particular personal pleasure in torturing God's servants out of his twisted malice for the heavens above. Thankfully, Abezathibu's cruelty was his undoing. When Moses parted the Red Sea, Abezathibu wanted to be there to see it in person, or in demon, I guess. When the Red Sea closed yet again, Abezathibu was trapped inside a pillar of air. But Beelzebub is confident he will return again. Number 3. Samael Samael is one of the more interesting entries on this list, namely because depending on the text cited, he's either an archangel of heaven or a fallen angel serving in hell. Angels to some, demons to others and all that. He's often referred to as the original Grim Reaper, and is thought to be where depictions of the Soul Collector stem from. Samael across most texts is known as the Angel of Death, a title that precedes itself. I mean, you hear the Angel of Death and you know I probably should not be messing with that guy. 
because I'm pretty sure they also call John Wick that sometimes. It's said that on the hour of a person's final release from this mortal coil, Samael will descend upon them, wings extended and sword drawn, dripping at its tip the poison that takes your life. Samael's name actually translates to Venom of God, again, in case you're wondering just how nice this guy is. Samael is known as the Accuser, the Seducer, the Destroyer, and a Midnight Joker. Samael's role as the Seducer is an essential one to the Kingdom of Heaven. He's seen as good and evil in the same measure, but he is only serving God's will. Tempting mankind is Samael's lot in life. It's been said as well that Samael is the one who planted the tree of knowledge and was the serpent who tempted Adam and Eve to bite the fruit. When Abraham was tested by God to sacrifice Isaac, it was said that Samael was the one who whispered into their ears to disobey. It's said that his ultimate goal is to bring an end to death itself, including the very concept of it. Once he's finished his ultimate mission, he'll be annihilated himself, and with death undone, his mission complete. Number 2. Mephistopheles Imagine you could make a deal for whatever you wanted, no matter how outrageous the request. Power, influence, romance. If all it took was your soul, would you do it? Well that's the offer Mephistopheles is prepared to make you. One of the most sinister servants in hell, Mephistopheles, or Mephisto as he's sometimes referred to, is one of Lucifer's right hand men. Responsible for bargains and deals involving human souls, Mephistopheles takes a great sickening pleasure in luring wayward souls downwards to the underworld. If Mephistopheles has already made himself present to you, I'm afraid it's already too late to you. He doesn't go out of his way to corrupt and tempt the innocent the way other demons do, but rather he finishes the job for those who've already begun to falter on a path they can't return from. In some instances, Mephistopheles' role changes slightly. Sometimes he appears to trick people into damning themselves. In others, they're already damned and he's just finishing off the inevitable. Most famously is the legend he originates from, where the bet he places with Faust for his soul, the protagonist of the ancient German legend, who made a deal at a crossroads with Mephistopheles. In exchange for ultimate power and the servitude of Mephistopheles while Faust lives, when he passes, Faust's soul will become the property of Mephistopheles and he will enslave him and damn him for eternity. Faust got what he pro was promised, and the terms Faust and Faustian now became synonymous with hard bargains out of this legend. Mephistopheles knows that he's essential to the cycle of the world. He knows that as much as we hate him, we need him. He tells Faust that he's part of the dark chaos that gives birth to the light. Sure, he's offering people in exchange for eternal damnation for mortal goods, but he is inspiring people in his own twisted little way. He's trying to get you to do better so you won't hear him knocking. Number 1. Leviathan As far as demons go, who's a bigger threat than the Leviathan? I mean, how could there even be a bigger threat? Leviathan, it's in the name, just let that sit in your mouth for a bit and think of something big. Leviathan is thought to be the embodiment of the sin of envy, and he is one of the princes of hell, and the grand admiral of hell's armies. It's tasked with pushing man towards temptation and the sin of heresy. Leviathan manifests itself as a behemoth of a creature, an incomprehensibly large sea serpent that would make HP Lovecraft blush. It's said to have impenetrable armored scales all over its body, and has monstrous claws as well, capable of destroying anything it would ever have to battle against should that ever arise. It's said that it can conjure up mighty bursts of flame from its chest like a dragon. Leviathan serves as the gatekeeper of hell, with the mighty demon's very jaws serving as the gates to the underworld themselves. Said as well that Leviathan's own flesh makes up the foundations for the walls of hell, and it feasts upon souls that attempt to escape the underworld. Foolishly, of course. As far as demonic power levels go, making up the literal corners of the underworld have got to count for something. How many demons can claim to be so hardcore they practically are hell? I can see why he's such a trusted lieutenant. Number 5. Slaw Our first entry on this list is something called a slaw, which manifests as a bird, predominantly something like a raven or a crow. We all know corvids are the scariest classification of bird there is. It's Celtic in nature, which means almost certainly I am pronouncing that name wrong. It's probably something more like slaw. They can take many forms, but prefer to do their hunting while donning the form of a corvid. What do they hunt exactly? Your soul. Your decaying soul, to be precise. These spirits seek out the dying, the weak, and stalk them, waiting like little carrion eaters. Not to worry, they also seek out the living too, waiting for the perfect time to strike. It's said that they seek out those who are experiencing heartbreak or intense emotional pain, so uh... 
Keep yourself in good spirits, I guess, lest you be attacked by the demon crows. The best way to avoid them, I can't believe this is what it said, but I looked it up, is to keep your windows and doors shut. Cause you know, they are birds. Stay inside and never say their name. Well, I probably should have read that part first, I guess. Sorry. Lore says that these demons were considered so evil and heinous that they were actually banned from hell. Imagine that. I did not even know that was a possibility. I thought hell was kind of where you kept all the most cruel spirits, but I didn't know you could be too hardcore for it. Love the image of Satan looking up at these birds and being like, get out, scat you. These creatures come from ancient Irish folklore, where they were first thought to be dark spirits, or just plain old evil entities. But as the years went by, slowly the narrative shifted that these birds were the souls of sinners and damned cast out of hell. In the early 1900s, these creatures were sometimes attributed to mysterious deaths around Europe, predominantly Ireland and Scotland. It was said that when petty criminals and ne'er-do-wells would turn up dead inexplicably, it was the handiwork of these birds. These birds, I got scared to say their name. I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to I'm just going to keep calling them these birds. These birds wait until your last tender moments on this earth, and when your soul is at its weakest, they swoop in and swallow your soul. What happens to a soul consumed by them? Well, I'm glad you asked. You become part of the flock, doomed to fly with them for the rest of time, feeding on other lost souls. But if spending eternity flying with a bunch of haunted ravens doesn't sound like your deal, I don't blame you. Why not spend eternity with the top five scary gang, and click through on the videos and watch forever and ever. Or maybe just an hour here and there. Toss a subscribe too while you're at it. Number four, Jigidinki. If you're familiar with the story of the Wendigo, and no doubt if you're watching Top 5 Scary, you're familiar with the story of the Wendigo because I can't go three minutes without shouting about the Wendigo, this spirit is very similar. It's sort of the Japanese Buddhist answer to it. The Jikininki are people who in life were terribly greedy, selfish, and now in death find themselves cursed to forever want more, to never be satisfied, and to also nefariously seek out human bodies to eat to satisfy their dark cravings. Yeah, I'm just gonna slip that one under the door. They stalk in the nighttime, scavenging for freshly deceased bodies and food offerings that have been left out for the dead. It's said that they loot the corpses that they eat too, which I'm gonna be honest, seems remarkably rude. I can understand eating the flesh of a dead body. You know, you're an evil spirit, we all gotta do what we do. But I draw the line at looting. It's a whole other thing entirely to root through their pockets for spare change. Folklore suggests that they use the loot they scavenge off of their victims to bribe city officials to leave them alone to their dark dealings. I knew politicians were corrupt, but I didn't know they took bribes from ghosts. Jinkies, that's a whole new level. It's said that the Jikininki look like decomposing cadavers, with inhuman features like glowing eyes and sharp claws. Interestingly though, some local variants of the tale suggest that they're able to disguise their true nature. They only take this demonic form during the night when they're hunting, and during the daytime, they're able to blend in like any other regular human, perhaps to help them scope out their victims. Should you ever cross a Jikininki, their eyes will be able to give it away, as you'll see the red glow behind their eyes. And when you do, you'll find yourself frozen in fear. Number three, Popabawa. Now that name might sound deceiving, cause to be honest, it does sound just the littlest bit cute. But this thing is the farthest thing from adorable imaginable. This terrifying demon hails from the island of Zanzibar in East Africa. If you don't know Zanzibar, it's where Freddie Mercury came from. Look it up, you learned something today. Popabawa is Swahili for bat wing, referring to the creature's most common form that it takes of a giant, vaguely humanoid bat creature. But the bat form is just one of its many appearances that it can take. A Popabawa can take on whatever it pleases and is more of a shadow creature than anything else, preferring to dwell in the darkness in a sort of formless way. Now, a shadowy shape-shifting bat creature would already be enough horrifying qualifiers to land this spirit in a top five list of scariest spirits around the globe. But it's this next little tidbit that really earns its spot on this list. The Popabawa specifically targets victims who don't believe in it. So, if you don't believe in Popabawas, you better start. You're in one. That's, that's not really how that joke went. It's thought to be behind the cause of an outbreak of hysteria through Zanzibar in the late 90s when there were several reports through village after village of men reporting that they had been attacked in the night by this demonic creature. It got so bad that eventually villagers would resort to sleeping outside their homes out of a belief that the creature wouldn't attack someone outside their house. Maybe there's like, I don't know, demon etiquette laws, I don't know. It's said that the Popabawa is hunting you if you can smell an intense smell of sulfur around your home. Mostly it comes out at night, mostly. The way it gets you is particularly unpleasant. Instead of just like 
eating you or slashing or doing something normal that a normal monster would do. The Popobawa crushes you during the night by sitting on you. Ha! People who claim they've been attacked say they wake up in the middle of the night with an intense pressure on their ribs and chest and have trouble breathing. It's been said that if you ever suspect you've caught the attention of the Popobawa, the best way to rid yourself of it is to spread knowledge and tell everyone everything you know because after all, it goes after non-believers. Not that um, that's why I'm telling you all this now, I've been sleeping really good. <laughs> My chest is doing fine. Number 2. Thus. I'd never heard of this demon before doing my little research for this video and let me tell you, it's a regret of mine that I didn't know about it earlier because my life has been improved since knowing about this thing. Venice is a demon whose main goal and pleasure in life is to convert good, pious, righteous people into nasty sinners so they can get pulled down into hell. It's hard enough trying to live a life free of sin without demons also trying to trick me into damning my eternal soul. I already can't walk down the street without coveting three things in a window. Now I gotta deal with this? Luckily for me, Vettis probably wouldn't be terribly interested in me since swaying me with sin is remarkably easy. He goes after priests, members of the cloth, people of devout faith. It's like his job to take charge of the really tough cases to tempt towards sin. He's a master of deception, seduction, trickery, bribery, intimidation, and a whole lot of other nasty demon business that probably looks good on his Tinder profile. Where he gets kind of wild though is that apparently he only ever talked in rhyme, which was supposed to help him lull you into a sense of comfort that causes you to trust him and makes you more likely to sin. I don't know about rhyme making me sin. That's feels like what they said would happen if I listened to rap music. Besides his freestyling bars, Vettis is a shape-shifting demon capable of taking whatever form he pleases, but he prefers to take forms that are wooden in nature, like a cursed tree or something for example. He's also depicted as often having many limbs growing outwards and fractal like a spider might. Most insidiously about all that Vettis does is that he stares deeply into your soul and sees your deepest, darkest, most sinful desires, meaning he has definitely read my Frasier fanfiction. Vettis then with his conjuring and shape-shifting makes your desire manifest in reality, where he can tempt you with sin up close and personal to see just how truly committed to the path of the righteous you are. And finally, coming in number one at the list is Moloch. Perhaps you've heard the name before. Moloch is an old god, real old, like Old Testament old. Moloch takes the form of an impressively sized deity with the head of a cow or bull instead of man, and usually he has his arms stretched outwards towards a fire in most statues or paintings of him. This is because this was his preferred method of sacrifice. Whatever you were to offer him, usually human, were to be cast into the flames for Moloch's pleasure. He's thought to be a pagan fertility deity, mentioned across various religious texts and worshipped by the Canaanites. Moses forbade the Israelites to worship Moloch as he was a false god. Moloch quite enjoyed sacrifices and being paid homage, and it's said that this was all ways to appease his wrath. In Paradise Lost, the epic poem that fleshed out much of what we know and think about hell, Moloch was described as being a fallen angel and one of Satan's greatest warriors. This depiction paints him as a bloodthirsty soldier of hell who is eager to spur a war against heaven's forces, and he is worshipped as a deity specifically to anger God above. Huh. Sounds like he makes lovely company. Number five on this list is Pelagius. Pelagius lived around 390 AD, and although very little is known about his personal life, we do know that the church was really not happy with his theological teachings. The Catholic gentleman says, Pelagianism radically corrupted the church's teachings on grace, sin, and the fall. Its namesake, the British monk Pelagius, taught that the sin of Adam had no bearing on subsequent generations. Essentially, man was inherently good and unaffected by the fall. In practice, this meant that a man could come to God by his own free will with no grace needed. Many saints fought against this doctrine. Saint David of Wales stands out among them especially, but it was Saint Augustine of Hippo, arguably the greatest of the Latin doctors and the church's mightiest champion against heresy, who rose to fight against this inherently venomous strand 
for thought. Against Pelagius, St. Augustine upheld the truth that God's grace is entirely necessary for any movement of ours towards God to occur at all. As he himself puts it, we for our part assert that the human will is so divinely aided towards the doing of righteousness that besides being created with the free choice of his will, and besides the teaching which instructs him how he ought to live, he receives also the Holy Spirit, through which there arises in his heart a delight in and love of that supreme and unchangeable good which is God. And this arises even now while he still walks by faith and not by sight. Everything about Pelagius's teachings went against what the church wanted. They wanted and believed that people needed to be committed to God through them, but what this man was teaching was kind of going against that. This scared the church a lot because it was undermining their power to act as the medium for the average human being and God. Therefore, Pelagius had to be stopped. There's no record of him being executed, but we do know that at one point he had to flee Rome and go into hiding to continue his work. Number four on this list is Asmodeus. Asmodeus is actually a demon, and whether or not he is real can definitely be debated. But what can't be debated is how scared the church was of him. Grunge says the demon known as Asmodeus appears in the book of Tobit, a Judeo-Christian book of the Bible that's either religious canon or apocrypha depending on which branch of Christianity you subscribe to. Asmodeus is said to be the worst of the demons. He doesn't hesitate to kill, and he has what has to be the lamest, most specific Achilles heel in the history of monsters. In the book of Tobit, there's a young woman named Sarah who would very much like to be married. She becomes engaged, gets married, and then right before the sweet sweet consummating, Asmodeus shows up and kills her husband. What might seem like a fluke quickly becomes a trend, as this happens to Sarah a total of seven times. On lucky number eight, Sarah, who must have been an amazing conversationalist for this many guys to roll these dice, marries a guy named Tobias, who the archangel Raphael gives the scoop on how to beat Asmodeus. The demon appears on the wedding night, and Tobias tosses a fish's heart and liver onto some coals, causing smoke that triggers Asmodeus's asthma, or something like that. Asmodeus scampers off, and Raphael tracks him down, ties him up, and strangles him. So luckily for us, the text says that there's no more of Asmodeus, but that doesn't mean that his evil spirit doesn't still linger on. This is a demon that we're talking about here, and one of the worst ones ever at that. So I wouldn't be surprised if getting rid of this guy for good is a pretty hard thing to accomplish. Also just a sidebar here, but poor Sarah, eh? This lady's just trying to get married and literally has to do it eight separate times before one finally sticks. I think after marriage number three, I'd personally just call it quits and get a puppy or something. Number three on this list is Beelzebub, another demon who is probably one of the most famous religious demons out there. Grunge says, Beelzebub, a demon with roots in old Philistine religions. His name comes up in the Bible a few times in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and he may be a stand-in for Satan, but another translation of Beelzebub is Lord of the Flies. John Milton's theory, described in Paradise Lost, is that he's a lieutenant of hell, second in power only to Satan, which is what folks in the industry refer to as resume gold. The starring role of Beelzebub's career is probably his part in the Salem Witch Trials, in which he was blamed for inhabiting the bodies of the accused. For anyone riding the fence on whether or not there was any real justice to be had there, it's worth looking at the writings of Cotton Mather, a Puritan minister in the area at the time. In his work of Beelzebub and his plot, Mather wrote that there is a devil in a thing doubted by none, but such as are under the influences of the devil. If Beelzebub was actually actually real, then he is responsible for the death of tons of people due to all of the witch stuff that went down. Not to mention just the trials, but what sort of stuff did he actually make these people do? It could be any number of things that we still don't even know about today. For obvious reasons, the church was not too fond of this demon. But it wasn't just the church. 
Your average everyday individual wasn't too fond of him at all either. Like think about it. Back in the day, you would have to worry about having Beelzebub come and get you, and then you'd be put on the stake for being a witch if he did. Now obviously, these witch trials were not done even remotely how they should have been, and it's unclear whether or not Beelzebub did or didn't play a role in them. But still, it doesn't change the fact that you would have been worried about him if you were alive back then. Number two on this list is Arianism. Arianism wasn't a person necessarily, but a full-on train of thought by many different people that the church was extremely scared of. The Catholic gentleman says, aside from the various Gnostic sects that plagued the early church, it is an Arianism that is arguably the most famous of all Christian heresies. It struck at the very root and core of Christian teaching that Jesus was God himself in the flesh and relegated the person of Jesus Christ to that of a mere created thing. It lives on today in varying forms, from well-known sects like the Jehovah's Witnesses all the way to the bizarre world of Apollo Quilaboy, moreover, it still lurks within the sentences of some modern theologians who ambiguously state that Jesus is the Christ, but no more than an exalted man. Saint Athanasius of Alexandria was the walking cure for this heresy. Stubborn and unshakable, I think it not a stretch to say at times that this great man stood alone against wave after wave of Arian attacks on the truth of the Christian faith. By emphasizing and stubbornly holding to the truth of Christ as both God and man, Saint Athanasius effectively ended the reign of the Arian heresy within the church. At the root, Arianism is basically the thinking that instead of being born, Jesus was created by God. This obviously goes against a lot of what the church teaches and believes in, and therefore they weren't too fond of this thinking or anyone who thought it. Pretty much anybody back in the day who did wholeheartedly believe this was condemned as being a heretic, and some bad things would be coming down the pipe if that was you. And finally, number one on this list is the devil. This one seems obvious, but just because it's obvious doesn't mean that we shouldn't include it on the list. The devil has always been the one to blame for any evil that is plaguing the earth. A great famine takes the lives of thousands of people. The devil did it. Someone loses their minds and kills a bunch of people. They must have been taken over by the devil. My coupon for 20% off on hot wings expired a week ago must have been the devil. Obviously, everyone was scared of the devil if he came for them. The church was scared of it, and the average person was scared of it. What is really interesting to me, though, is that the devil, even though he is horribly scary, is actually necessary to religion and the church. Without a devil, the only person to blame for anything bad happening would be God. The guy who's supposed to look out for us all the time would actually be the one doing all of the nasty things that happen to us as well as all of the good things. Therefore, if we wish to believe that God is good and has our best intentions at heart, we sort of need to have a devil around to take the blame for all this stuff. It's just interesting to think that without the devil, one might be able to argue that we are the most scared of God. Not sure how I feel about that, but a cool thought experiment nonetheless. Number five, Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles, or Mephisto to his friends, is a demon who features prominently in German folklore. Although he has since become somewhat of a stock character, he is primarily known for the role he plays in the Faust legend. The Faust legend is inspired by the life of a real alchemist, astrologer, and magician, Johann Georg Faust, who lived in Germany during the late 1400s and early 1500s. It is, of course, unclear how closely Faust's life follows the legend it inspired. The tale of his interactions with Mephistopheles has been passed down for centuries after his death. In the folk legend, Legend, Faust has become depressed with his life as a scholar and tries to take his own life. When the attempt fails, he calls on the devil, hoping to acquire magical powers that will allow him to indulge in all the earthly pleasures he can imagine. The devil then sends his representative, Mephisto, to make a deal with Faust. Faust and the demon broker a deal that will make Mephistopheles serve Faust with his powers for a set number of years. When that time is up, Mephisto will claim his soul and take Faust to hell he will be punished and forced to serve Satan for all of eternity. Faust uses Mephistopheles for a variety of purposes over the years, most famously to help him seduce a beautiful young maiden named Gretchen, with whom he has a child. When the child is born, Gretchen realizes the baby's unholy nature and throws it into the water, causing her to be arrested and executed for murder. Faust is corrupted and realizes his sins are unforgivable and is carried away to hell by Mephistopheles. True or not, 
not, the Faust legend has become deeply ingrained in culture, and I'm sure the Vatican worries that their flock will not realize the message of the tale and will try to make deals of their own with Satan's representative, Mephistopheles. Number 4. Incubus One of the more taboo evil spirits on this list is the Incubus, the male equivalent to a succubus. While a succubus is known for seducing and sleeping with men in order to impregnate themselves with ghostly children, the Incubus comes into a woman's bed while she is asleep and impregnates her. She will then carry the baby to term, giving birth to deformed witches, wizards, or demons. Not all of these offspring become evil, however, with the first legend of a wizard being fathered by an Incubus actually being the legendary wizard who served King Arthur during the days of Camelot. In the late 1400s, demonology text Malleus Malficarum by the German Catholic clergyman Heinrich Kramer, the author talks about incubi and states that there are five ways to get rid of them. Moving the afflicted woman to a different location, exorcism, sacramental confession, the sign of the cross, or excommunication of the attacking entity, which even the book itself admits is basically just another term for an exorcism. If we are to believe Kramer's account, then incubi seem to be relatively easy demons to get rid of. You know, for a demon. Being subject to all of the usual tricks of the exorcist trade, and being able to be shaken by simply moving. But according to the works of the Franciscan friar Ludovico Maria Sinistari, they are much more difficult to deal with than the typical demon, with him saying that an incubus does not obey exorcists, has no dread of exorcism, shows no reverence for holy things, at the approach of which they are not in the least bit overawed. If this description is true, then this would be one of the types of demons the Vatican would most dread going up against, as none of their usual tools or techniques seem to have any effect on this seducer from hell. Number 3. Master Leonard I never thought someone named Leonard could be frightening, and yet here we are. Leonard is one of the spirits or demons featured in the 1818 demonology text The Dictionnaire Infernal by Jacques Collin, which describes various demons as well as their hierarchies. Leonard is described as a three-horned goat with the face of a man who uses his horns to initiate his followers and grant them satanic powers. His job title is Grand Master of the Nocturnal Orgies of Demons, which is undeniably impressive. He is known for having banquets thrown in his honor by his followers, where they all consume the flesh of a stillborn goat, which is then eaten without salt and boiled with reptiles in order to depurify the sinless meat. He also has a habit of transforming into a handsome young soldier and luring young women into the wilderness, where he will impregnate them, with all the resulting children being stillborn as an offering to sin. Male followers of Leonard are granted the ability to transform into monstrous animals, or even the incubi, which we already detail. What makes Leonard so frightening for the Vatican isn't just his ability to corrupt people, but the idea that his actions directly lead to more demonic creatures, that they are then unable to effectively fight being created. Number 2. Abaddon the term Abaddon is a Hebrew word, meaning destruction or doom. The term is used in the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible throughout both the Old and New Testament to describe moments of doom or destruction, such as in Job 26, verse 6. The Sheol, meaning grave, is naked before him, and Abaddon has no covering. But it is not just a catch-all term for doom and destruction in the Bible. It is also a figure in the book of Revelations chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and it was given the key to the pit of the abyss. The star opened the pit of the abyss, and smoke rose out of it like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the pit. And out of the smoke locusts descended on the earth, and they were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The Locusts were not given power to kill them, but only to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. And the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle, with something like crowns of gold on their heads, and faces like the faces of men. They had hair like that of women, and teeth like those of lions. 
They also had thoraxes like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the roar of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, which they had the power to injure people for five months. They were ruled by a king, the Angel of the Abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. The identity of Abaddon is up for interpretation, but many believe that he is the Antichrist and others, Satan himself. Perhaps more optimistically, some consider him to be a representative of God, being a resurrected Jesus. Most interpretations are pretty dire in their assessment. If Abaddon is really Satan or the Antichrist, then it makes sense the Vatican would be nervous about him and his army of locusts. Number one, Beelzebub. Beelzebub was a deity worshipped by the Philistines, whose name is literally translated as the Lord of the Flies. He was worshipped in Ekron before he was adopted by Abrahamic religions, not as a god, but as a major demon. In Christian theology, he is one of the seven princes of hell, representing the sins of gluttony and envy. In the Testament of Solomon, he makes an appearance saying that he was a fallen angel associated with the planet Venus, or the evening star, making him synonymous with Lucifer in this particular appearance. He claims that his methods of destruction are installing tyrants, causing people to worship demons, to cause priests to indulge in their lust, and to cause jealousies in cities and murders, and to bring about war. Some texts conflate Beelzebub with Satan, with others making them different entities. In these versions, he is said to have led a successful revolt in hell against the devil, being the chief lieutenant of Lucifer. He is one of the three most prominent fallen angels, alongside Lucifer and Leviathan, with certain texts such as Paradise Lost, describing him as being second in hell only to Satan himself. He is given credit for a lot of possessions and evils, with his name being cited often during the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 and 1693. His ranking in the hierarchy of hell, in addition to the understandable anger he would have at being displaced as a deity only to become a demon, would make me nervous if I were a member of the Vatican concerned with going up against demonic forces. Number 5. A Time Machine Among the many conspiracies about what goods are hidden inside the Vatican's secret archives, one of the more popular and reoccurring ones is that the Vatican has access to wondrous technology hidden away from the rest of the world, from ancient civilizations, stuff like that. One leading theory is that among these devices is something called the Chronovisor, an alleged time machine of sorts that allows the user to peer inside and see whatever time period in history or forwards they desire, like a little time camera. Doctor Who would love it. One Italian monk, one Pellegrino Ernetti, claimed that he developed the chronovisor at some point during the 1950s with a team of 12 esteemed scientists who all wished to remain anonymous in the process. I would put my name on that if I invented time travel, personally. I'd want people to know. The chronovisor is described as consisting of antennas and uh, an unknown metal that's really good at looking through time, a little knob for tuning to a particular time and place, and a screen and recording device. Ernetti described that he and his team used this machine to view speeches by Mussolini and Napoleon, scenes from ancient Rome, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ which they allegedly tried to take a photo of. Now obviously no one's seen the chronovisor. If such a device was to exist, it would naturally be pretty secretive. An Italian magazine in the 1970s claims that they found that image of Christ's crucifixion, the photo that was taken through time only to discover that it was actually just a postcard. So this one's a bit up in the air. Let me know if you think this is real, but also, you know what? Let me know what time period you would want to take a picture of, if you could see that up close. And if you're looking for way more scary content, my friends, my friends, you already know Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We've got everything scary under the sun. Cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, fake crime, aliens, UFOs, just about anything freaky you can think of. So click on through, subscribe, stay scared, and don't miss a single thing. But Keep watching this video too, okay? We worked hard on it. Number four, the three secrets of Fatima. Over a hundred years ago, three young people in Portugal from the town of Fatima claimed that they were visited by the Virgin Mary herself in a vision and the Madonna shared with them wondrous prophecies and visions onto them. These visions, allegedly, were the Second World War, the rise and fall of communism, and the death of a pope. And these were referred to as the three secrets of Fatima. Very cool prophecy stuff. Now. 
The story goes that the Madonna would visit these three shepherds every six months on the 13th day of each month on the dot. She was very punctual. Influenza would end up claiming the lives of two of these prophets, leaving only one to share messages with the world and then only briefly too. Conspiracies and conspiracists state that the things the Virgin Mary told the shepherds weren't quite reported on accurately and in truth the church knows the real secrets that were bestowed upon the Fatimans and that these were way too dangerous to be let out and had to be suppressed and controlled for fear of civil unrest possibly pertaining to things that could damage the church's good reputation or change the nature of society as a whole. Maybe the answer as to whether or not that dress was white and black or gold and blue the whole time. An alternate conspiracy is that there were more secrets that the church knows about but refuses to share. Maybe four secrets of Fatima. That makes sense. They're called the secrets of Fatima, not the tell everybody's of Fatima. You want my theory? My conspiracy? Virgin Mary told those shepherds of Fatima the recipe for KFC and Coke and the Vatican realized quickly that information is just too sensitive. That's got to stay under wraps. Number three, proof of aliens. Well, we already talked a little bit about some of the credible technology that could be inside this archive. And it's thought that the Vatican has all sorts of incredible information hidden away in its vaults that humanity we're just not ready to know about. We're not grown up enough. One of the other leading ones is that theorists speculate that inside those secret, secret archives is indisputable hard evidence of extraterrestrial life. That they're harboring alien skulls and remnants of amazing technology. I guess on borrow from Area 51's collection it's traveling. So the story goes that in the late 1960s, during renovations of the Vatican's archives, excavators uncovered alien skulls beneath the Vatican archives and somewhere the predator is so upset that he lost those. Is it possible that they worried that if proof of extraterrestrial life got out into the wild it would discredit belief? Yeah, out there. It wouldn't be the first time, you know, Galileo was famously locked up for his wild beliefs about the celestial bodies that would turn out to be fairly true. So would aliens be any different, really a different story? A Russian engineer named Genrik Marvikich Ludwig was an esteemed scholar who in the 1920s was invited to the secret archives to study. A very prestigious position offered to like less than a thousand scholars a year. According to him, while there, he uncovered documentations that discussed the influence of aliens on civilizations like the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Mesopotamians. Ludwig found records of use of atomic weaponry predating the Manhattan Project, suggesting that this hyper-advanced technology had been in use for years and humanity's leaps and progress were all reverse engineered from our visitors. Maybe the pyramids really were aliens. <laughs> Would certainly be something if that ever came out. I hope in our lifetime, you know, I hope we get to see some aliens and I hope we get to see an alien elected pope someday personally. Number two, proof Jesus never existed. Or did. Now among the things that you would think the Vatican would really want to keep hidden and on the DL would be proof that the Lord and Savior did not exist. This is another popular conspiracy theory emanating about the Vatican that one of the things they're trying to cover up is some alleged document that insists Jesus as we know him wasn't quite real or wasn't as reported accurately. That would make sense. If I was the Pope, that would be like the number one thing I would want to keep under wraps, right? That would probably destroy the church overnight if that ever came out. Now on the inverse of this theory is a similar theory, totally different direction though, stating that the Vatican secret archives contains indisputable proof that Jesus did exist, including correspondences between Saint Paul and Emperor Nero, history's favorite bad boy, contemporary paintings and depictions of the man, which would be pretty groundbreaking. You'd wonder though, if they, if they have that, why would they keep that secret? You know, I would, I would leak that one. Now, if you believe this conspiracy and you can carry on with it, it does get a little wild. One author, one Michael Bagnet, claims that the correspondences inside the archives, they prove Jesus did exist, but here's a crazy twist. He didn't die on the cross, as you know, we all know, but rather there was a very complicated scheme with Pontius Pilate to secretly fake Jesus' death to appease the citizens of Rome. Sounds a little bit more like the plot line to a Dan Brown novel. It's a little fantastical and if true, would probably be the greatest conspiracy theory in, in human history and maybe humanity's most tightly guarded secrets if there's any weight to it. So definitely, you know, if they knew that, they would probably keep that under wraps, keep that in a drawer <laughs> locked up tight, not let anybody see that. And number one, the Illuminati. Maybe this is one of the most widespread conspiratorial beliefs, maybe one of the oldest conspiracy theories out there, really. 
is that the Illuminati, the centuries old secret society that once started in Bavaria would eventually grow into an organization capable of challenging the church and overtaking it. And if you believe the conspiracies, it's clandestinely pulling the strings behind everything, controlling the world from the shadows, inserting key members of its order into the highest levels of government, religion, the Disney corporation, the rap industry, and also including their symbols hidden in everything. That one, I guess just for like fun, <laughs> just to, I don't know, flex. May I just say though, if the Illuminati are real and, and controlling things, they have got to be the least kept secret order like imaginable since, you know, I'm talking about them. <laughs> Well, the conspiracy goes that the Vatican is closely, closely tied with the Illuminati, with some believing that cardinals and the papacy are all tied to Illuminati interests, and that the secret archives contain bountiful proof of this, memos, meetings, plans for world domination, etc. The Vatican's archives date back centuries, nearly a thousand years worth of old papers, with some documents containing secrets of the Knights Templar, who are thought to be the originators of Freemasonry, the group that would become tied with the Illuminati, that's who the Illuminati was based on. Surely some of those Knight Templar meeting minutes would be particularly illuminating, if you'll pardon that absolutely horrible pun. Of all the ones on this list, I think this one is the most outright likely, since we know the Illuminati did stem from the Freemasons, and we know that there was a real Illuminati, that's an indisputable fact, and we know the Knights Templar, we know all of these groups did exist, and it's very likely that there are some secrets inside the Vatican's archive containing references to those three groups that could fuel the plot lines for the next 12 years of Assassin's Creed games. We got some good conspiracy stuff in there. <laughs> 